So today's training is bystander intervention. We are joined by Usman Alou from the uh, Council on American Islamic Relations. So Usman is the programs coordinator for the San Francisco Bay Area Office of CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. And in this position, he leads CARE's signature programs, including youth engagement programs. We were just talking about a uh, really wonderful youth political education program that he's currently in the middle of. Um, also anti-hate workshops, the intern and volunteer programs, and much more. And I also just wanted to give a shout out to folks. I don't know if anybody from that group is with us right now, but the, the reason we specifically reached out to CARE and that we are lucky enough to have Usman with us today is we got a request from a group of folks within the coalition uh, from the AAPI community who had been meeting and, and talking about how to better reach the AAPI community sur survivors from that group um, and work that we could be doing as a coalition and within member centers. And the, the request to bring in care for this bystander intervention training specifically came from them. So thank you to that group for making the request and getting us here. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Usman, and I'll, I'll be around if anybody needs anything, please uh, feel free to use the chat or just unmute. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Kelsey, and thank you for the warm introduction. Um, give me one second. Let me go ahead and share my screen really fast. Let's see if I can get this up here. One second. Okay, awesome. Can folks see that? It's good. Okay, cool. Awesome. So thank you all. Um, as Kelsey mentioned, I am Usman Alu, and um, like to welcome you all to today's bystander intervention training. So I'm again, um, I'm the programs coordinator over at Care SFBA. I'm in charge of our different, you know, most of our different programs, whether it be youth engagement, political education, um, our volunteers, our banquet. Um, right now I'm running a program called the Muslim Game Changers Network, which is really incredible. Working with um, high school students from like the age range of like 14 to about 17 and um, working on political education and bringing in facilitators and really having them get involved and really boosting their, you know, political education and also just their awareness and there's, you know, they're being involved in social activities and, you know, the social political climate as well. And I will be leading today's training and we're, I'm really excited to get started, of course, but first, um, before anything, there we go. First, before anything, I want to give a shout out to the Montgomery Civil Rights uh, Civil Rights Coalition, as they are the pioneers of our training today. They are the ones that created it, and um, they are the ones who will be using. Um, so they're the ones who are credited with creating this original training, and they've been pioneered pioneers in this field for a really long time. And this training is the one that um, we use from them, and that we've eventually revised as well. And I also want to note that um, we have an incredible amount of important material to get through today. So, of course, if anyone needs to, you know, get up to, you know, we're virtual. So if you need to step away or if you need to, you know, take care of yourself, whatever it might be, or the material gets too heavy at any point, um, please feel free to, you know, step away to take some time for yourself. I know there's a lot of, you know, black screens with just names on there. So, I, you know, do what you must, you know, take the time that you need. But also I wanna make sure, you know, at any point, um, whatever it might be, if, if you have any questions, if you have any comments or, you know, you wanna open discussion, please feel free to do so. Please feel free to, you know, um, 
comment in the chat box or raise a hand, whatever it might be. We'll be monitoring that. So I would love to answer as many questions as I can and be as interactive as possible. And great. So we give you all an introduction on us. So who are we? Um, so CARE, um, how many of us here today are familiar with our work at CARE? Um, anybody? Make could be a show of hands, maybe here, or even a comment. If not, there you go. Awesome. Yeah, so I see a few of you. Um, but yeah, for those of you who are less familiar with CARE or whom this might be your first time actually encountering us or our work, um, we'll start by knowing that CARE SFBA stands for the Council on American Islamic Relations. And we're all the way out here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I know many of you folks are in Connecticut, if I'm correct. So I know it's a little bit far away, but our work, of course, um, you know, it's all intersectional and a lot of, you know, a lot of the issues and a lot of the civil rights related material that we cover. Um, we are a nonprofit grassroots civil rights and advocacy group. Um, we're also America's largest, you know, Islamic civil liberties group. We've got over 30 offices that are nationwide. And here in the San Francisco Bay Area, actually, like officially, we are actually the oldest um, care office, and the oldest care branch um, outside of the actual branch that was founded in DC, where our founders were from. And so since about 1994, which is when our office opened up, we've been working to uphold, you know, civil rights of American Muslims, of our allies, you know, and all Muslims as well, or all Americans as well, to foster, and also to foster a better understanding of the Islamic faith and its followers, and also help uh, find avenues for Muslims and, you know, those and religious minorities as well to more actively participate in the broader range of society. So just to kind of fit briefly like finish up there, the core of our actual work is based around providing free, confidential, and also culturally competent uh, legal assistance to individuals who are discriminated against because they are, you know, American Muslims or they're perceived to be American Muslims. And more recently, we've also launched um, an immigrants' rights program as well, which makes immigration legal services more accessible. Um, to members of our community and just kind of beyond direct legal services, right? Um, we also work to, you know, provide a barrier American Muslim voice um, to the media. We're really big on lobbying to our elected officials on issues, you know, that are related to civil rights, that are related to religious freedoms, whatever it might be, and also conducting workshops, just like the one that um, we're leading here today, and that I'm here with you folks to lead, and to empower you know, American Muslims and also our allies. So we're really proud, of course, of the work you know, that we do and that our colleagues do as well. But I think it's really important that we consider you know, why it is that we have to do this work at all. So the reason our work really is necessary is because there are overarching um, structural aspects to how American society is organized and how it operates that really oppress and also exploit, you know, various groups and classes of people. So these structural aspects are really deeply rooted in the history of America, and they manifest in so many different ways, right? You know, they manifest themselves in whether it be racism, it's classism, it's patriarchy, it's homophobia, it's xenophobia, it's there are so many other forms of bigotry that we see all around us today that are manifestations of these aspects, right? So now, while our work at CARE, you know, it might be centered specifically on Muslims and American Muslims and empowering us, um, who often face discrimination and injustice because of their religious practices, um, it's also intersectional to many of us. We think about, we are just mentioning about the AAPI community, right, with since 2019 or so, we think about, you know, we think about with COVID starting and how drastic of a rise in AAPI hate that we've seen. Um, with AAPI hate, we also think about gendered violence that has been, you know, incredibly high as well. And folks that are in the LGBTQ community, especially those that are transgender, like the hate crimes and hate experiences that they experience and a lot of the discrimination that many of us. So a lot of these issues and these hate crimes that often many of us face are really intersectional. So it's really important for us to really think about that and kind of expand beyond, you know, beyond just the American Muslim view as well. 
So I also want to quickly briefly mention like in terms of like Muslims, like for us, like um, American Muslims are a really diverse population, just like many others. Um, many are racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, there are 20% that are considered black. There are a huge portion of the population is undocumented like many other folks and a greater than average portion also earn less than thirty thousand you know dollars a year or maybe they're under or unemployed even so in addition to like islamophobia or even like general xenophobia right um, many of us whether we're muslim or you know we constitute with any other group um, we face other kinds of oppressions as well as, you know, sometimes religious, religious hate and religious discrimination. So we really believe that we have to be kind of structural and intersectional in our analysis and not only our analysis, but in our practice as well. So to kind of sum this up with a few, you know, adages that, you know, most of us are definitely familiar with. Um, there's one that is until we're all free, none of us are free from Emma Lazarus. And of course, from the great Martin Luther King Jr., if we think about injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, right? So again, because these are really deeply rooted uh, structural issues that we're up against, it's necessary for us all to really be involved in these different movements for social justice and social change. So this can mean taking part in a broad range, there's a really broad range of activities that you can you know, be a part of whether it be from lobbying your local and national elected officials. Um, it could be engaging in organized direct actions and protests. And today though, we're gonna really focus in on one specific problem that I've been mentioning. And that is hate crimes, hate incidences, and also incidents of harassment. And really a specific way of addressing this problem and addressing this issue for, you know, to preach safety, right? Um, and that is bystander intervention. So while of course hate crimes, hate incidences, and harassment, they're all themselves symptoms of, you know, of a larger, you know, a larger oppression that we've been talking about. And bystander intervention is really only the most immediate individual way of addressing those problems. However, we believe that there really is, you know, there's value in this training, both because it is a way to provide short-term relief that is important, and also safety for marginalized and also for targeted communities. And because it's also a good way for community members like all of us here to really start getting involved in larger, longer term struggles for justice. So it's also important to note that, um, as I've already mentioned, many of us, many communities and groups of people have been facing, you know, terrible problems of hate crimes, hate incidences and harassment for really a long time, right? It's also important to note that um, we have data showing that it's been getting worse in recent years. Um, we also think about the election in 2016 and what that has led to also post, you know, after that and even since then. And, you know, while the data I have on the screen is, you know, focused on American Muslims, I also have, you know, other really important data that we've compiled from, you know, our, our work and our research, as well as other um, organizations as well that I just think it's important to share with all of you. So just to kind of put this into perspective, um, in 2021, a study that was conducted by the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism, um, they found that here in California, um, there was a 173% increase in anti-AAPI hate crimes in Los Angeles alone, and uh, just in that greater Los Angeles area. And then while that number is staggering in itself, um, just another statistic that they also discovered was that there was a 567% increase um, in hate crimes in San Francisco in 2021 alone also. And just to briefly you know, build off of that, Stop AAPI Hate documented 931 hate incidences in the Bay Area alone in 2021. And our from our org, our 2022 CARE National Civil Rights Report um, documented a 28% rise in hate crime incidences being documented nationwide. So while those numbers are staggering in themselves, uh, many of these are, you know, incidences are also really underreported or are, you know, not properly documented for whatever reason. Um, and even kind of just to think about another example, I recently met with um, a local senator here 
you know, here in California. And he was telling me about a assembly member from his district who was going on a hike in San Francisco. And he's an Asian, he's an Asian man himself. And on that hike, as he was walking, he was hit by a brick by um, somebody who was, you know, and enacting a hate crime against him because he was Asian with, you know, reciting slurs as well. And he hit him with the brick. And I mean, that's an assembly member, right? So not only that, but so many of us in the community, whether it be elderly folks, whether it be LGBTQ folks, whether whoever it might be, right? Many of us, the, the threat of hate crime is incredibly real. And we have to, you know, this training is important because we need to have a way to address these incidences and to provide, you know, immediate relief and immediate support for, um, immediate support for those of us that are targeted in this way. So to kind of bring this to, you know, closer to like the actual experiences of people within our own community, I want to go ahead and ask um, an important question if I can to you folks, um, which is, um, I want to ask the, ask the room here. Um, I know it's virtual, but folks can raise a hand. You can maybe, you know, leave in the chat, but I want to ask um, how many people have experienced or maybe witnessed or even heard about an incident occurring in their community um, sometime over the last several months, you know, that's a hate crime like this. See if some hands raised, yeah. We see in the chat as well. Great, and I know, um, I realize that it can be really difficult to talk about um, these kinds of things in front of, you know, a group of people or just in general, but would anyone who maybe raised a hand or who maybe left something in the chat, um, does anyone have maybe a personal story or a personal, you know, something that they've heard from the community, you know, regarding this type of experience? I um, think that it's kind of, you know, important that we hear about and also think about, you know, individual narratives while discussing these issues. So does anybody maybe want to take a, you know, speak on it? If not, I totally understand. Feel yeah, free. My, yeah. my son works at a Starbucks in Waltham and has a lot of friends in the LGBTQ community and people that he works with and like, just very close with. And I guess it was a week and a half ago, something like that. One of the customers came at one of his staff and like using all the words, shove the kid up against the wall. It gets like 19. Mm. Um, and, you know, the kid ended up backed up against the wall. It, it, the customer came into the yeah, like the server side didn't even stay on his own side and um because the kid supposedly made the drink wrong mm. and you know the kid was shook my son is his manager he was shook um he handled it as best as he could in the in the moment and everything else but it, it, like texted me later that night and just like wanted to really know like what the hell is wrong with people. And this is in a supposedly, you know, accepting area of the state. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the reality, right? I mean, we think about you you mentioned um, the supposedly acceptable area. Like we think about San Francisco, like here in California, about how it's supposed to be supposedly you know acceptable also but with you know, this incredible rise in hate crimes and i'm you know so sorry to hear about that also and it's the experience right that many of us you know many of us have to you know are unfortunately forced to face um but i hope everything is okay there too but kind of bring that back to like the community aspect right it could be any of us it could be anybody you know in a different place it could be on the bus it could be at starbucks it could be wherever it might be in our workplace right so this kind of brings us um 
I'll leave room open. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'll leave room open if anyone else quickly wants to mention like an example or two. Um, you don't have to, I totally understand. Um, it's really heavy, you know, heavy topic also, but if not, I can share uh, something recently. Um, we recently work in, you know, we deal with a lot of client intakes and we deal with a lot of, you know, direct community members and community members experiences here, you know, in our office. And I remember talking to one, you know, one older woman who was waiting in line for the, the transit here called BART. Um, and she was waiting to go to work and um, somebody didn't like that she was wearing a head covering, right, a hijab. And in a you know, in a hate crime incident there, they pushed her, they tried to push her in front of the train also. So things like that are so pertinent. There's so many stories that we hear over and over again, especially that are really heavy. And also like for me, like kind of to bring it into like the personal narrative aspect, like my sister wears a head covering and she, you know, takes public transit every day to go to work. My mom, same thing, you know, so it's definitely very real for many of us and it's very heavy, but to bring it back to um, our training, like the goal of to kind of bring us back to our goal for today um, is to be prepared for what to do when, you know, when we witness something like this actually happening and to practice putting our principles into action. And also to think through, you know, what it might be like to actually engage in nonviolent de-escalation in a variety of real life situations that we'll go over today. So that we can address questions and also come up with additional strategies together as well. And that way, um, all of us hopefully will leave here today feeling, you know, more prepared and more confident to really step into different kinds of difficult situations as a bystander. And so to get there, we're going to go through the following training outline for today, which is... Excuse me, give me one sec. First, okay, there we go. First, we'll spend a few minutes talking about, you know, the different values that we have that underlie our training. And then we'll walk through a series of steps um, that you can use when intervening in different scenarios. And then after that, um, we'll talk about ways to secondarily intervene, which is incredibly important, which all of us can do, which is you know something like collecting evidence and also reaching out to authority figures. And then after that, after that, we will do our our small breakout groups, um, and we can all practice intervening, you know, in a variety of different scenarios, kind of virtually, of course. I guess you know, not acting them out, but kind of like imagining yourself in the situation and playing the different roles that that we all will see. And then, of course, throughout this, you know, lastly, we'll wrap up with time for final questions and discussion to kind of you know go over like general, you know, how everything went. But again, I want to mention um, throughout this training, throughout the course of it, please feel free to, you know, drop a question or engage in conversation with me. I'm always here to answer as much as I can to and work with. And I think it's best that way that we all work through, you know, our questions and the material together too, of course. Awesome. And so that's a lot to cover, of course, but we should really be able to get through it um, within our within the time span here. And one final note, kind of before we really get started into the like into like the concrete, you know, steps and whatnot. Um, and this will come up later on as well. But I just want to note that this training will not um, teach you how to deal with you know situations of like immediate immediate danger. So if a situation becomes physically dangerous, um, our recommendation is to leave as quickly as possible with as many people as possible as well. Excuse me. And if you're interested, of course, we also encourage you to take additional self-defense classes, you know, to deal with these types of situations. But awesome. So we can go ahead and get started here. So our values um, that we've talked about, our values that um, we're going to take a few minutes to really, you know, really go through and they underlie our training which are safety safety solidarity and safety solidarity and support which i'll bring up here for us so reviewing our values is important because the reality is that one training can't necessarily cover every single possible you know scenario 
And really in the heat of the moment, it may be difficult for you to remember every single little detail of our training today. But by using your own critical thinking and also being guided by these values, you should really be able to stay, you know, stay on the right track with your intervention. It's awesome. We'll go ahead and read through our list of values here. Um, for our first value, we have safety, right? So we believe that de-escalation is the safest way to respond, um, not only for yourself, but for everybody involved. So again, with a scenario like this, with a diff whether it's a hate crime, it's a hate incident, or it's an incident of bias, right? There are many unknown factors that are involved and that are involved in this situation. And also something to think about is that you never truly know what a stranger or what you know, another member is capable of doing you know, whether or not, you know, what danger they might, you know, they might be towards you or towards someone else or they might possess or what, you know, even oftentimes what their intentions might be, right? You never know. So it's important to really think about this, um, especially because there's a lot of unknowns. And it's also important to really be aware of how your intervention specifically affects everyone's safety, right? So throughout this training, um, you'll hear it over and over again, but we'll discuss, you know, how various choices, um, how they have different repercussions and what they look like and, you know, what they can lead to also. And also we believe that practicing um, really helps us get past our hesitations. So by doing so, we can act in, in the time when it actually might happen, God forbid, but when it does, we can act when necessary, right? So be, to practice, um, we'll think about things like being able to hear and see, you know, what is happening around you also. Awesome. Great. And then some of the training today, I know it's going to be, it's going to feel strange. And uh, I know on the virtual platform, it's also you know, a lot different too. But practicing now, um, it really means that you're more prepared when you actually need to intervene and when you actually are in the heat of the moment. So in order to practice here, it'll really help us kind of think through everything and also get these core values and the steps um, in our head and already you know, that we've practiced so that we can be prepared when the moment happens. And then our next value is support. So at the end of the day, it's um, we are there as bystanders to support what um, the targeted person in the scenario wants, what they wish, and how they feel is best to handle the different their situation. So this means that we, as bystanders, provide options for the targeted person, and we also act according to their wishes and what they feel is best. So kind of some brief like guidelines here. We ask um, the targeted person if, first and foremost if they want our help in the situation and we also ask you know how we can best help them and we ask before we touch them of course so as anything in life consent is of course essential when intervening to assist a targeted person um, especially when it's in public or it's you know it's somebody that you might not know you want to make sure that you're you know you can be startling them right too also and they're already in a threat in a situation that could be threatening you want to make sure you have consent from them as well in order to, before moving forward if you can and also um something that we kind of we kind of mentioned you know, that's important is that we want to shift our focus of the situation to the actual person who is being targeted and we want to only interact with them as much as possible. And something that may sound weird now, but will make sense later, is we believe that it's important to actually ignore the attacker in this, in this situation. So we do this um, because it's both more effective and because the actual targeted person, we believe that they deserve our attention way more than the attacker, and they deserve our support, our solidarity, and our and the safety that we can. And they. Truly, they deserve the um, autonomy in the situation if we can provide that for them. Which leads us to our final value, right? Which is solidarity. So to us, um, as we've already mentioned, nonviolence is the most courageous way to respond. 
So I totally understand. I totally get it. It's really easy to lash out, especially in a really heated and really, you know, threatening situation. It's really easy to do so and let your, you know, let your emotions take over you. But it's also, it's very difficult to really hold them in and also act from a principled place, which is something that we must do. You know, we must do that. We must think about our steps, our values. We must act accordingly. Um, and you may not feel that you're ready to do this right now, right this second, but through this training and through practicing and through thinking everything through and through critical analysis, this definitely will help. And you definitely will feel more comfortable to be more calm, more you know ready and more prepared to deal with a situation like this and make sure that everybody involved is safe as well. And I also want to briefly mention that we're there um, in the situation as bystander or as bystanders, we are there in solidarity with the person who is being targeted, right? So we're not there as someone's savior. Um, and I know I totally understand that um, as humans, our natural inclination might be to go to a source of trouble and really try to make it stop or try to be the hero. Um, in other words, you know, engage with the attacker directly, maybe take them head on. But we recognize that this really isn't the most strategic way to respond. And really, it also doesn't necessarily empower the person who was already being targeted in an already tense situation. And one final point to mention is that we do not call the targeted person um, the victim or a victim because we want them to retain their agency in the situation and beyond also. So we want the targeted person to retain the ability to decide how they will respond, and also how you should respond and the other bystanders involved as well if possible. So at the end of the day, our goal is to empower the targeted person, which means that they feel that they can alter the course of the situation and take back some control and take back some agency, you know, in this situation and beyond. Great. And that um, leads us to our different steps that we have that are involved and in how to actually directly, you know, how to directly um, engage and directly, you know, nonviolently deescalate here. So now that you know, like the values and that we've kind of covered, we've covered them pretty in depthly and that we've been able to think about them that underlie our training, it's time to get more concrete about the actual steps that are involved in a successful intervention. So, I know this cartoon might be a little bit older, but I feel like many of us have probably seen this around. Um, it went viral on Facebook ooh, probably a while back, and it shows how you might help a woman with a hijab who is being targeted on public transportation and the steps involved in doing so. So just to kind of give like the credit here, the cartoon was created by a French cartoonist whose name was Meryl, and it's a really great, um, at visually demonstrating some of our points. And so we're gonna go ahead and use it as we go over our different steps here. So as you see the cartoon, our first step, right, is to assess the situation. So to be ready to intervene. Um, first and foremost, just like, just like anything, right? You wanna make sure that you are mentally and emotionally prepared to enter this situation. So maybe like a quick, you know, general well-being check. Am I, am I in the right, you know, headspace to handle this? Am I capable of doing so? Am I the best person for this? Should I get others involved, right? Um, am I able to handle this right now? And also um, to be aware, right, of what's happening around you. Um, so the person who is being targeted might also need help, you know, finding mental health resources or counseling after, but also in terms of being aware of what's happening, let's say you're on public transit, for instance, right? And I'm a, you know, passenger. If I have headphones on, that might look like me taking one headphone out and, you know, keeping one in so that way I can hear what's going on around me or I'm aware of what's going on or I'm aware of the exit routes or aware of what is going on in general, right? And, you know, who is involved and who other bystanders are too. So just kind of be aware of what's happening in your surrounding environment. Great, and then our second step um, is to get others involved. And to do so, we must beat the bystander effect. So 
I think many of us have probably heard of the bystander effect, but if not, it's a psychological phenomenon where the more people that are present to actually witness an event, um, the less likely any of them will actually be to step in and help. So this is because we as humans disperse our responsibility onto the people that are around us. But you know, you have the power to return someone's responsibility to them by simply letting them know that they should be acting and that they should be involved in, this, in these situations. So that can look like something like, um, by simply telling someone like, hey, do you see what's happening over there? Um, I think we should, you know, we should do something. I think we should get involved. I think you should record. I think we should try to help if we can, right? So the people you are near, um, if, you, if you're able to lead or if you're able to encourage them, the people that are around you will be more likely to get involved also. And you'll all be able to beat that bystander effect and really take that leadership on yourself. And also um, it's important through this training to really give directions to others also on how to intervene, right? So once you've involved kind of the other people around you and the other bystanders in the situation, it's important that you take the lead and give them, you know, other bystanders directions, you know, as I kind of mentioned. So it's really unlikely that you'll yourself run into other bystanders who have training um, in de-escalation or even bystander intervention, all, even though I've, you know, hopefully all of us can at some point. Um, and that means that even if people want to help, they may not know necessarily what the best way to do so and what that might be and how that might look. So in order to give them directions, again, you can do something by simply saying, you know, telling another bystander like, hey, um, can you stay here and maybe record what is happening right now? And I'll go talk to, you know, talk to the target person. I'll take care of them. I'll provide, you know, I'll provide them options what they might need, but can you simply record or, can you simply be here as backup just in case or provide support, whatever it might be? Excuse me. And that's a really great way to safely involve additional bystanders as well and kind of work as a team in this situation, if possible, right? That's, of course, assuming that there are other bystanders around. which leads us to our next step, which is to intervene calmly. So a great way to do so is to, you know, introduce yourself to the targeted person and quietly explain, you know, hey, I saw what was happening and I would like to provide support, you know, if that's possible. Um, it's really important to be aware of your tone and also of your body language as you move closer to the targeted person, especially since, you know, they're already going through and they're already, you know, potentially being harassed or being discriminated against. And you want to make sure that they do not perceive you as a threat also, right? Um, and it's best to really come in at eye level and also have a calm tone and you're, in, you know, in talking with them and providing them options as well. And Something that you could do when, uh, when introducing yourself, for example, it's best to be straightforward and say something like, hi, my name is, you know, my name is Usman. I saw what is happening and I want to be here to support you. Um, can I sit next to you? I know that um, if, if folks take other bystander trainings or other nonviolent de-escalation trainings, I know that oftentimes the strategy that they tell you is to kind of, you know, just start a random conversation or, you know, um, act like you know that person before and why you can't do that. And I'm not going to advocate against that. Just our recommendation is to kind of calmly introduce yourself and just, you know, discuss like you saw what's happening, right? And you're just there for support as well. It's easy. We believe that's the best way. And also, again, as I've already kind of mentioned, um, it's important to ask for permission before doing anything, right? So if the person, you know, they say that they're fine and that they don't want support, um, you can go ahead and move back, you know, move back, of course, but I'm not saying to leave the situation, right? Um, you can move back, but you want to make sure that you're there monitoring and you're there still, you know, assessing what is going on and being there just, you know, regardless, just in case. Um, something that you could do is you can let the targeted person know that you'll be nearby, you know, just in case that they change their mind or in case that they need something or in case it escalates as well. And then our fourth step, which is to ignore the attacker, which might seem might seem uncomfortable now, but which through more explanation, we'll definitely understand. So we want to ignore the attacker, even if they escalate verbally, right? It's at this verbal level. So 
So we believe that ignoring the attacker, it really has a greater chance of de-escalating this situation. But of course, you know, that isn't guaranteed, right? None of this is guaranteed, of course. Um, if the attacker doesn't de-escalate quickly, um, it's probably important to think of alternate solutions. And at that point to think about, you know, being informed on your exit routes, for, for example, or, you know, how to get others involved there or just have other solutions as a group also. And I guess I kind of like briefly just touched that, but, or mentioned that, but to also be aware of the attacker's location and the exit routes around you for your safety and for everyone's safety involved. So you may need to consider, you know, asking the targeted person if they would like to leave the scene with you, um, especially if the attacker continues to escalate, you know, just think about your safety, think about their safety and the safety of other folks that are involved as well. And then after, you know, continuing to support the targeted person throughout the incident and beyond, right? So let's say that you're able to nonviolently de-escalate and you're able to, um, you know, um, able to def defuse this tense situation. Um, after the attacker leaves or after you're in a safe location, it's important to continue speaking with the targeted person. Um, it's important to let them know that they should report this incident if possible, um, whether that be to CARE, for instance, you know, um, us as a nonprofit or the ACLU or any other nonprofit or any other agency that works, you know, civil rights related or that are able to report hate crimes um, in your area. I know it's different for folks. I know there's a lot of different organizations around, but at least for California, right, we used to typically have something like CARE at the ACLU. Um, and also it might be important to help someone find um, mental health resources, right? Or even counseling. Um, and then also to make sure that they get to their destination safely, right? You don't wanna just help them and then just be like, okay, see you, bye, right? You wanna maybe offer to walk someone or walk the targeted person um, with, you know, offer to walk with them or, you know, help them get transportation or whatever it might be, you know, whatever that might look like. So I know that was a lot and I know it's a lot to hear at one time too, but kind of just thinking about our steps, you know, in more of like a, you know, an order here, but let's say that you experience this type of situation, right? Like a brief overview here. So the first step when experiencing this, you assess the situation, right? You're ready, ask yourself if I'm ready to intervene, am I ready for this? You know, can I handle this right now? Um, and to be aware of what's happening. Maybe, as I mentioned, if you have two headphones and take one headphone out, um, be aware of what's going on around you and the surrounding environment and being alert. And then getting others involved, right? So really beat that bystander effect and take lead that leadership role and ask others around you to really, hey, like, do you see what's happening here? I think that we should get involved. I think that we should, you know, step in and we should provide support for this person and the, and for their safety also to really beat that bystander effect and give them that encouragement to partake also and kind of give that encouragement to yourself too, right? This is a really, you know, it could be a really, you know, potentially threatening situation. Like if you need that encouragement as well too. And then to give others directions, like other bystanders directions and to lead them. As I've mentioned, not many of us will have, you know, actual nonviolent de-escalation or bystander training. So many folks, while they're eager to help, they might not know necessarily how to help in the moment. So lead them, give them directions. Hey, I think you should record this or, hey, I think you should stay here and, you know, monitor this situation. And then when approaching the targeted person, right, to intervene calmly. Um, as we've mentioned, introduce yourself and really quietly explain like, hey, I saw what's happening here. You know, my name is so-and-so. Um, I would like to help you and I would like to support you. How can I do so? And of course, being calm, if you can, eye level, um, calm tone. You don't want to be perceived as a threat by someone who was already, you know, who was already alert of what's going on around them, especially someone who was already experiencing this, right? And then when doing so, ignoring the attacker, right? And really, even if they verbally escalate, um, you still want to ignore them. And we believe, of course, that the targeted person in the situation deserves our attention. They deserve our care. They deserve our support, whatever it might be. They deserve that attention from us and not somebody who is attacking someone else. And they do not, you know, they do not need that attention more than they already have. 
we want to retain the agency to the person who was targeted. And I just want to mention again, um, I think something that's um, to think about is that you don't want to call someone in the situation a victim, right? Um, we like to use the term targeted person just so that they can retain their agency and really get their agency back in a situation that's kind of might be out of their control, right? And as always, be aware um, of the attacker's placement and also the targeted person's placement and exit routes that are around you too. And then finally, the support after, right? Um, continue to support the targeted person after this event and after this experience. So after the attacker leaves to stay with the targeted person, maybe provide them resources, provide them, you know, ask them if you can walk with them, whatever it might be. Um, and maybe help them to make, help them make it to their next destination if possible. Great, and that kind of, I know it's a lot again, but that kind of covers our steps. So we've gone over the different values that underlie our training. So we remember something to remember safety, solidarity and support. And then we've kind of gone through the steps, the general steps of how to intervene and how to nonviolently deescalate and provide support for the targeted person in the situation and right to get others involved too. So another really important and you know, pertinent um, piece of information here is how to secondarily intervene. So one great way to do so is to practice, you know, how to capture video quickly, right? So one way to do so, one way to secondarily intervene is, as I mentioned, capturing video and audio evidence of the incident. So this could be important for seeking, you know, legal remedies after the incident or, and it's also something that um, you can do if it is, even if it's difficult or impossible for you to get to the targeted person, or it could be something that you maybe ask, you know, ask another bystander to do while you speak with the targeted person actually. So I just want, again, this isn't a know your rights training per se, but um, I can quickly kind of cover like the legality, at least of collecting evidence in public. So while it is legal in all states to capture images of people in public, right? In many states, it is illegal to record someone speaking um, in public without their express permission. So, I know it's different for each state, but of course, be aware of what the laws might be. But at least for us, I'll speak from California. Um, if you're a resident in California, it is illegal to record someone without their consent, you know, if they have a reasonable expectation of privacy. So to kind of give you an example, I think about the bus in the bus scenario again, right? So if I'm sitting next to Kelsey, per se, on the bus and me and Kelsey are having, you know, personal conversation, um, just talking about, you know, whatever it might be, it would be illegal to record us, right? Because we would both expect our reasonable privacy. Um, but if I'm on the bus and I'm shouting at Kelsey, who is all the way at the back, um, and I'm shouting and everyone can hear, at that point, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect any, you know, I wouldn't expect um, reasonable privacy there. And it'd be totally, you know, there'd be no expectation of so it would be totally legal to record that as well. So just to kind of quickly cover that legality, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and then also just to kind of think about it in a different way too, sometimes, you know, recording a scene can really bring a bad situation um, to a rapid end. But of course you can also risk, you know, escalating the situation. Um, maybe the attacker doesn't want evidence, you know, of their behavior. So be prepared to monitor you know, the situation continually and put your phone away, right? If it begins to feel dangerous. So you can also, something else that you can also do is to lower the phone, right? So you're not obviously filming or at least you know, maybe have the audio function rolling. Great, and um, just other kind of important information in terms of recording. Um, when you're recording, you know, I know it's it could be incredibly difficult um, depending on the situation, but so you people know, can get violent with you if you're recording them. Okay. Um, again, uh, just to go back to that point, um, when you're recording, try to keep the phone as stable as possible, and 
if you need to scan the scene, um, do it as slowly as you know as is appropriate, um, even if you're tracking the action, right? And another thing is to um, try to record record the scene in um, sideways orientation as well. So not only will you capture more of the scene that way, but it's also the same size and orientation as television as well, um, which is helpful in case um, the video is ever broadcasted or whatever it might be, right? I think what Marsha said when she had unmuted there for a second is that sometimes people get violent when you try to record, if they see that you're recording them. Mm. Um, so would your, at that point, your recommendation would be like, this doesn't feel safe anymore, so we should stop and like try to move away? Yeah, yeah. So in a situation like that, right, as soon as it escalates to beyond, you know, that verbal level or beyond, you know, the level um, it escalates to like a physical violence or, you know, physically threatening at that point, um, it's far beyond, you know, you know, at that point, your safety and the safety of others around you is the most important, you know, in general. So our recommendation, right, is to look for safety and to look to, you know, get out of that situation as quickly as possible and with as many folks as possible. Um, especially, you know, as I mentioned, right, we never know what someone else is capable of, especially in these, you know, someone that you don't know, right, what, what their intentions might be. So at that point of physical, physical threat or physical violence, um, at that point, to try to get out of the situation as quickly as possible and try to get, you know, authorities involved too after if need be or whatever that might look like. But at the end of the day, as soon as it escalates to that point, your safety and the safety of the others around you is the most important. And I totally understand in terms of recording, you know, folks, you know, they might not want their, you know, actions to be seen by others or they might be embarrassed and whatever it might be, or they don't want others to know. And I get that it could be, um, they could escalate to that point. But at that point, um, again, I mentioned safety, whatever that might look like. That is a good point. And thank you for bringing that up. And um, I really, you know, appreciate that and be, to be able to explain further too. Um, it's a good point. Yeah, and then kind of building off of all this also, um, we kind of, throughout our training and over the past, you know, we've been doing this training since about 2016 or so, since the election, the first initial election. And we kind of have compiled like a few questions that have been, you know, really, we get all the time and that are really, you know, folks are always the most, you know, interested in and I always mention and kind of these what if scenarios, right? So the first question that we often get asked is, should you call the police um, in a scenario like this, right? So of course, every situation is different and circumstances are different, you know, depending on what is going on. But in general, um, we advise people, you know, not to necessarily immediately call the police unless a situation has become physically violent, you know, as we just mentioned. Um, and this is because, you know, there are many people who see the presence of police as a risk of escalation in and of itself, right? So there's a you know, wide variety of reasons why this might be, but um, one, you know, this could be because someone is undocumented and maybe they fear arrest or because their community's experience, like many of us um, with the police has been, you know, disrespectful or has been dangerous, right? And another thing, um, just maybe something that we don't necessarily think about is that we recognize that there is often a strong element of privilege also, right? Um, privilege that is on the basis of race, it's on the basis of class, gender identity, and, you know, ability in general involved in feeling free to call the police um, into a situation. And also, logically, just thinking about it, we also know that if a situation didn't previously, you know, involve a firearm or a weapon, um, by calling the police, you know, we've bought a firearm into the situation, which oftentimes could decrease, you know, the chance of de-escalation um, in itself. So as a bystander, just important to remember that we are there to support the targeted person. And that means that the targeted person, if possible, right, gets to have the final say about whether the police are called. So if possible, you want to ask the person, you know, if you're thinking that the police intervention could be useful, um, and then to follow that person's lead and to act accordingly to, you know, their agency and what they believe is best also.
And then another question that we um, commonly get, you know, often is, you know, hey, like, what if this bad situation, like, what if it actually involves, right, police, like, police misconduct? Like, what to do then? Um, now, it's always legal, you know, to record the actions of police as long as you're not actually interfering with those actions. So I want to mention again, like, right, of course, this isn't a know your rights training, um, per instance. So I'm, you know, I'm not gonna be able to go super in depth, right? And, um, I don't want to do so. But the police cannot um, legally ask you to stop recording, or to delete your recording, or to hand over your phone, right? So something that we encourage is to download the ACLU's mobile justice app, which is incredible. And of course, the ACLU is um, really great. And they're one of our you know, biggest partners. And I'm not sure if it's available in Connecticut or not. I know in California it is because it's through some states, but in general, um, I know there's apps that are similar as well or similar organizations. Um, but this app, you know, it really allows you to take um, to take a video and immediately send it to the ACLU. And it can also um, be useful if it looks like someone is going to try to maybe take your phone, right? So information on on the app and would be available in your app store or online as well. Or as I mentioned, I'm not sure what the uh, what other organizations might have, but that's um, probably, you know, that app is the one that we recommend, of course, here in California. Great. And then, so I know it's a lot of information again, but um, we can go ahead and does anyone have any questions or any comments on the material that um, that we've mentioned so far. I know it's a lot, I know folks. I know there, um, this is more, this isn't necessarily related to mm -hmm. like the specific incident that or like example that you were giving us of like a, just a person in public mm -hmm. harassing someone, but in terms of recording things, um, there was just a, I, I can't remember what state it was, but I know I saw something recently where like a state or a, or maybe a municipality like passed a law saying that it was, you couldn't record the police from closer than like eight feet or something. There was, it was just like in the last week or two. Um, I don't know if anybody else heard about this or like knows, can talk about it better than I can, but um, I don't know if that's the kind of stuff that's going to start, we're gonna, if we're going to start like seeing more legislation like that in different places um oh yeah Connecticut I guess it's just a good thing to be aware of for folks yeah I guess it's probably best I mean I guess to be aware of any in terms of legality right whatever it might look like um I that's the first that I'm hearing of I'm, I mean it might be in other other places but at least here um, um you're allowed to um there hasn't been any any laws passed that might you know might um, hold you liable for anything, but um, that is why you have organizations, civil rights organizations and other advocacy groups as well to protect your safety and protect your rights also. And um, ooh, that's the first I'm hearing of that. That's interesting. You should, um, if you can, um, send that to me by chance or maybe link that and whatever might be, a, be interesting to look at. Um, but I guess, yeah, to be involved and understand, you know, what the legality looks like for different states. I know every, every municipality and every state also at the local level is different. So to be informed on that, but at least here, I know for a fact that there's nothing like that, thankfully, but um, whatever that might look like. I think there's some, there some in the chat also. We were just talking about that. I found it, I found oh, an article. Okay. Um, Harley mentioned that it's Arizona. So wow, that's the I first put one link there. there. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, it'll be interesting to follow this because I know there are other communities that have tried this mm -hmm. and ultimately got struck down in today's current climate. Like, who knows? So it'll be interesting to follow this and see where this falls out. Yeah, definitely. Um, especially with how, you know, I'm not going to go into like the police brutality, for instance, like necessarily, but like it's being able to, I mean, it's a, your basic freedom, right? Being able to record and being able to 
document, right? It's important, especially for, you know, safety for folks and to document, you know, hate crimes or hate incidents or whatever it might look like. So it's interesting to see and hopefully they don't, um, hopefully we continue to push back against anything that's infringing right on rights or infringing on our civil rights or civil liberties too. So definitely something that we, like as an organization, I know for a fact that we push back against, you know, any kind of any kind of laws like that and we've been pretty good on that especially with like um, mass surveillance and surveillance also but yeah that's thank you for um, sharing that with me and that kind of leads us to so we've gone over right um just a brief overview we've gone over our values we've gone over our steps the history all of it now I think it's most important that we kind of practice these different scenarios and these different examples um, kind of together. I know it's difficult on the virtual platform, but um, in these examples, we can go ahead and break out into um, small groups. Um, I don't know if folks know each other or you might be meeting people for the first time, but um, in these groups, um, go ahead and, you know, of course, introduce yourselves. And also we have the examples on the screen for, we'll go through about four of them. Um, and I'm gonna give everyone about, I don't know, anywhere from four to five minutes to kind of discuss these examples together. But, you know, in each of these scenarios, we're gonna give you a situation. And then maybe as you see on the screen, kind of suggest some ways that you can respond um, to support the targeted person. And those are just kind of like starting points, right, that are based on, you know, the different principles that we have and also be creative, right, and really see what your group can come up with and, you know, share with one another. And I have roles up here also, right, um, in your small groups. I know there aren't, you know, we'll have probably about three or four people per group, but there'll be an attacker, right, um, a targeted person, and then the rest will be bystanders, depending on the situation but decide in your groups who will be playing each role by chance. And then, or even, you know, just discuss the scenario in general. And then after about uh, four to five minutes, we'll reconvene together and kind of discuss as a group and hopefully really engage um, with one another. So our first scenario that I have that I kind of want to get folks thinking about, um, which is the one that we've already, you know, we just mentioned also, but, um, to kind of think deeper, right, and deeper analysis. And that first scenario is um, a man who is harassing a woman with a hijab or just a general headscarf on public transportation. So let me go ahead and... Is it possible, um, Kelsey, to create the breakout rooms on here? Yeah, um, I wonder if I need to make you a host to be able to do it let's see either way if you're able to or i can do it too um you said three or four people yeah Any three or four people sure. you know what i think i just gave my power to do that away to you so now it's, you can do it <laughs> okay gotcha Okay, there we go. 